Okay, well, thank you very much um, for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, the topic of uh, the paper uh, we wrote with, um, with uh, Peter Clark and uh, a new student, Rob Tillman, uh, hasn't really been much talked about, and I think it deserves more attention, certainly, than I'm going to give it, which is uh, how to apply causal model search, which is really a whole field that Judea started and has grown an awful lot over the last uh, 20 years, um, to real applications and real science. So there's been an awful lot of theory. There's been an awful lot of algorithms developed. But there's not been, I think, a lot of attention paid to um, d d uh, developing real case studies with real scientists using, um, using this technology to uh, uh, not only talk to each other, but talk to the people doing the, uh, the science out there. But before I actually start, let me just um, say a few words uh, thanking Judea for um, uh, this incredible change that he produced in my career and certainly the career of my colleagues. So uh, Stuart Russell referred to the glorious revolution, I think, of 1988, and I, I fully agree. So in 1988, we were all uh, laboring away at Carnegie Mellon with um, linear causal models, looking for uh, connections between statistical constraints and causal structure. And the tradition we were in was really from Herb Simon, Hubert Blaylock, who were doing prediction equations, right, from linear structural equation models to vanishing correlation, partial correlation sort of constraints. And even going back before that to um, uh, uh, Charles Spearman with tetrad constraints trying to establish things like the existence of a single general intelligence factor. And uh, uh, we were struggling in lots of different ways, but we were certainly uh, bounded by um, the, the linear formalism we were working with, and in particular, all we could really manage to do to connect the, uh, the causal structures to the constraints was first order vanishing partial correlations. So you had correlations, and when they were partial on one variable at a time, right, you could connect the uh, statistical constraints to the graph, but that was, about, that was about all we were able to do at that time. And then uh, my recollection is very vivid. Peter went to a, a conference, and Dan Geiger gave him a copy of Judea, Judea's book. And uh, when he came back, uh, we all read it. And that really completely changed everything uh, uh, instantaneously. Clark read the uh, sections on causality and said, uh, well, I'm not sure of any of this. And uh, if you know Clark, that was incredibly high praise. <laughs> uh, you, you, usually when he reads things, the first thing he says, this is completely stupid and idiotic. And, but by saying, uh, I'm not sure of all those who are aware, oh, we better take this very, very seriously. Uh, Peter was uh, obsessed with the factorization. You got it from the distribution and the graph and the constraints imposed. And uh, I uh, became obsessed with deseparation, uh, which I think if there's any single key to the causal universe, I would say it is deseparation. So, so uh, we got into these, we got into these uh, great arguments about how deseparation was to be explained in any theory we developed. And uh, I thought that, um, that there was this uh, very, very beautiful way to get single paths and that making those paths look deconnecting or deseparating by looking at each variable as a valve that you could turn on and off by conditioning. So I developed this metaphor that was a, a plumbing metaphor. Right? It was a pipe. And information could flow either way from one variable to the other on the pipe, depending upon whether all the valves were open. And the valves were closed when they were colliders until you condition on them. And they're open if they're non-colliders until you condition on them. And that was just great, except for the descendants of the colliders <laughs> and the parents of the colliders. So after large arguments back and forth, we finally decided that if you conditioned on the descendant of a collider, it was like a drain stopping up. And you could back up the drain and then open <laughs> up the collider that way anyway. So, so after very, very long arguments, we actually, in our 1993 book, put in these causal pipes as a way of explanation, proceeded to go to a conference. And then in the first uh, conference we went to, uh, there were a whole bunch of philosophers there. And as philosophers are wont to do, completely got confused by the whole thing. And so uh, I was humiliated because people were saying, well, is it true that these causal pipes mean that there's this Humean, uh, uh, the, the, the Humean refutation of causality is really wrong, and there's all this juice that's flowing in these pipes from variable to variable? No, that's not. <laughs> so I was the, uh, I was the uh, object of um, huge humiliation and uh, derision in the, uh, in the group there uh, until um, uh, Larry Wasserman came down from the stats department 
And uh, he came to our uh, office and he said, uh, I read your book, and, uh, uh, and he was, by the way, a statistician that was awarded the prize for all statisticians under the age of 40 as the best in the country. And so this was a few months after that. And he comes into the office and he says, I read your whole book and uh, I didn't understand any of it except for the causal pipes and deseparation, <laughs> which was the only thing clear in the whole book. I was like, thank you, big victory was mine. But the second idea, uh, so anyway, deseparation turned out to be the key to all the algorithms that I think uh, people have developed about using independence to motivate um, or search for causal structure. But the other idea that I think was so incredibly important in, in Judea's book was the idea of a, an equivalence class. So um, you, you just heard a little while ago um, uh, Sander say, uh, you can't just write down a causal graph and expect that to be uh, the answer and to be guiding us in scientific. He's absolutely right. Uh, but that's not the story. The story is what you want to do is you want to characterize the set of causal graphs, including anything you're, you're considering, that are supported by data. And that's all you can learn, and you can't learn anything more. So given the appropriate semantics and given the appropriate assumptions, one can compute in many, many cases what the equivalence class of causal models is given a set of data and given a set of statistical inferences about what independence relations hold uh, in the population that generated that data. And so in philosophy, I think, the way to look at this is this is really the solution in some sense to the epistemological problem of causation. This is what we can learn and no more. And that's what one has to return if one is trying to be honest about what really is going on uh, in data. OK, so um, there's been lots of, lots of case studies that really employ causal model search in some important and essential way. Uh, they've ranged from biology. There's good work by Bill Shipley. There's new work by uh, a guy in uh, biology in Princeton, John Story, looking at figuring out the, the regulatory structure of the yeast genome uh, by looking at promoter regions, coding regions, and then looking at conditional independence relations between the promoter and other genes conditional on the coding region. And so out of 6,000 genes, he's identified 19 potential regulators, and now he's doing follow-up experiments where he's knocking out those genes or regulating their expression and testing to see if the hypotheses generated from the model search are in fact correct. And of the ones he's actually tested, he's about five for six. So, so far so good. A little better than the coin flip Sander was talking about in epidemiology. There's more work in geology. There's more work in medicine, uh, psychology, and brain science. There's new work going on analyzing fMRI data, trying to figure out the cascading regions of, uh, of the brain and how they cause each other, and activity levels, and processing. There's interesting work in economics, political science, sociology. And there's a whole new area, I think, that's opening up that would be really uh, uh, interesting to see um, embraced by this technology, which is education research. So there's more and more online courses being produced and data being collected from these online courses. So not only keystrokes, but tagged interactions that the student engages in. They ask for help. They take a quiz. They do an exercise. They do a lab, et cetera, et cetera. They do a final exam. And we can use all this data and generate hypotheses uh, through these search techniques and then test these hypotheses later on with experiments uh, that do actual manipulations. So I'm just going to describe very briefly two incredibly simple case studies uh, that everybody should be able to follow with no effort at all. Um, and they're, they're partly in response to uh, Jamie Robbins and his challenge when he came to uh, CMU in, I think, 1994, and said so he read the book and he said, this is just impossible. If you have three variables and one is prior to the other two, and that one is independent on the third given the second, you can infer causality. This just can't be. <laughs> right? Well, it may not be, but at least here's a couple of plausible attempts. So um, partly in response to uh, this new topic, a bunch of us got together and put together a course that we put online with lots of interactions, including a module on deseparation, which involves an intelligent tutor that tracks the students' concept modeling of the deseparation and how they've learned it. Uh, and the course has been offered to over 70 different, um, um, uh, different course sections in 30 different universities to thousands of students. And uh, well, one of the things that we're, we were challenged with in the course was, does it work? is actually improving learning, and if so, how. So we did a series of experiments uh, in which we 
um, looked at a lecture version of the course versus the online version of the course and tested the efficacy. And it turns out the online version was just as good or better, including when I lectured it, so I couldn't win and I couldn't lose. Um, but after we established that it was as good or better, uh, the, the question was, well, how or why? What's the mechanism by which this might be actually working? And so um, in order to do this, we measured several different things uh, that the students were um, able to give us data on. We gave them a pretest. Um, we measured how many of the modules in the course they actually printed out. We measured their quiz scores on an average percentage basis. And there were hundreds and hundreds of voluntary exercises throughout the course in which they were able to do the exercise if they wanted to, but didn't have to. And we wanted to keep it that way because if you're a student in the course and you're fast and you're quick, uh, you don't want to be bored by doing the exercises. You don't have to. But if you're a student who's really going to be helped by the exercises, uh, it would be really good for you to have them around to do it. They're interactive. There's feedback given immediately. And our hypothesis, of course, was these were the key to really learning the, the, the material. <coughs> we gave a final exam, and there were nine other variables of all different sorts that represented hy hypotheses about what might be actually causing learning. So when we did a search on the data we gathered from these students, uh, we introduced background knowledge, right? It was of a temporal sort. So the pretest was administered first. It couldn't be an effective anything. Uh, the printouts, quizzes, and voluntary exercises were during the course, all right? They couldn't be an effect of the final exam. Uh, otherwise, among the variables in tier two, anything could happen. And uh, the, uh, the nine other variables I won't go into. So when we ran this through the algorithms that we have uh, developed, including the possibility that latent confounding exists in these models, this is essentially the output we got as a linear structural equation model. And, and so what it says is that we don't know if the pretest is causing people to print out more modules, because that this little circle represents causal ignorance. This might be a confounder. Uh, there might be uh, a direct cause. We don't know, and the data can't tell us, given our background knowledge and assumptions. Same thing from the pretest to the final. It's plausible that the pretest measures something in terms of aptitude that causes the final exam, but we can't tell from the data. But what we could tell, or what we thought we could tell, was that the printout was having a negative influence on how many voluntary questions one was doing. What was happening was the students were printing out the modules, taking them home to read, and then the interactive exercises that were voluntary were not available in the printout. And so they were too lazy to go back and do the voluntary exercises. Instead, they would take the printout, read it, and that's it. And so printing out the modules, even though it seemed to be positively uh, affected by how your pretest aptitude looked, that was having a negative effect on voluntary exercises, according to our lights. And the voluntary questions were having a large positive effect on both the quiz scores and the final exam. So this was great. This was a theory we could test in a future year by doing an actual intervention of manipulation. So I should just say a, a, a brief word is, in, in this exact structure that Jamie was, was cautioning us about, you had three variables, right? We knew that pretest was prior to printout. And we knew that pretest was in, independent of voluntary questions conditional on printout. And that allowed us to orient this edge Right, as a causal edge without confounding, given the assumptions that I won't go into in detail. Okay? So it said that printing out the modules had a negative effect. And it also allowed us to orient the effect of voluntary questions on final exam as a cause. So what we did in the next year was uh, intervene by telling people that uh, printing out the modules is fine, but if you're going to do that, you better go back and do the voluntary exercises. Right? So we did that, and we collected more data, and then estimated a new model uh, on the data. And what we found was the structure of the model was virtually the same. I left out the quiz questions here. It's not important. The parameters estimated to be almost the same values, except for exactly the ones we intervened upon. We destroyed, this is really an insignificant edge, the connection between the pretest and the printouts. Now, in fact, if anything, the, the better students were printing out fewer of the modules. Uh, if they did print it out, it still had some negative effect on the voluntary questions, but we explicitly told them that if you want to get a good grade in the course, don't let that effect happen. And the voluntary questions still had uh, an identifiable causal edge into the final exam with around the same value. So we took this to be uh, 
an enormous success for the whole enterprise of generating hypotheses, doing intervention, and testing it with model search technology. And it's as simple as you could be. How much time do I have? Five seconds? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I was gonna do, I was gonna do another, another example, which I'll do in 10 seconds, if you allow me, uh, which is a, a, a student from the School of Social Work at Pitt came over and uh, had this project involving stress, depression, and religious coping. And they had measures of these things that were uh, uh, multiple Likert survey items. And their hypothesis was that religiously coping with things helps one deal with stress and uh, uh, negatively affects depression and controls it. And after doing a, uh, an enterprise which allows us to come up with a better measurement model for these latent variables and then estimate the causal relations among the measurement model, what we found was exactly the opposite of what the student wanted which is that stress does cause depression, but it's depression that causes religious coping, <laughs> not the other end. So I'm sorry if any of you are religious and I've offended you, but that's what the data seem to say. So.